Hey, Martin, thanks for joining us today. As we're getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Hi, Brian. Thank good to speak to you. Uh, my name is Martin Siddle, uh, and I've been selling uh, technology into the legal sector in, here in the UK probably for the last 30 years. Um, during this time, I've been lucky enough to sell a variety of systems. So I've sold accounting systems, ERP systems, document management systems, CRM. But most of my success has come from selling what we call case management or workflow solutions um been really really successful in that and i guess over the last 30 years i've had every job <laughs> you can think going in sales from sales rep to sales director everything in between um and i'm currently head of account management at a large um content firm called lexis nexus and you just found lawyers fun to sell to an easy community <laughs> <laughs> fun may not be the right word um they're certainly different. Um, and, and I think one of the things that is different is you're actually spending their money rather than spending a corporate's money. So one of the things I was told by a very old salesman very early on is you've got to imagine you're selling to a lawyer. He has to go home and tell his wife she can't have the holiday because he's just bought a new piece of tin for his computer. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a different type of sale. And I can't imagine a more difficult persona yeah um they like to argue a lot they like to discuss <laughs> a lot uh, they have lots of questions um and contract negotiations are very interesting and they also assume or they they take the truth as something that's subjective <laughs> yes very much so very much so um and the other thing that's really strange is a lot of them still buy by committee so whereas you may think you have the champion, you may have it nailed down, you've then got 10 guys in a room that are arguing their own case. And, and of course, you're not invited into that room. So from that point of view, it, it can be quite complicated. Because they are profession, professional arguers. Absolutely. No, that's their job. That's what they're good at. Yeah. And why did you pick this demographic or persona? Um, I sort of fell into it by accident, like a lot of things you do. And I started off in hospitality, believe it or not. Um, just the opposite. Yeah. Just the opposite. Um, and then by chance, I ended up working for an American company as their operations director. Um, and I did that for a couple of years. But the guys you know, with the nice cars, the good suits, and the things making all the money were the sales guys. So I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And 30 years later, I'm still doing it. And is that what motivates you? Kind of the, the winning, the, the income, um, the growth? I think what gives me most satisfaction is actually working with clients and looking at how we can improve the way they run their business. Um, but actually, the most fun bit is closing deals. I know you're not supposed to say that these days, but I think um, it's all about closing deals. <laughs> Isn't it about hugging and rescuing animals? And <laughs> Yeah. I'm not sure about you, but when I first started out, there was a champagne moment when you closed a deal. You know, everybody was really pleased for you. Now it's almost like an inconvenience that you've actually closed a deal. Now that's not right. I don't think that's right. Another one of those pesky customers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and what's kept you uh, at the same company for so long? That's a, a great track record. Yeah, I mean, I've been where I am for about 18 years, and, and I say I've worked in legal tech for the rest. Um, I guess working for a very large organization, you get to move around a lot, uh, and it almost feels like you have new jobs every five years, um, but you get the benefit of retaining the clients, keeping your market knowledge, knowing your client knowledge, um, and really becoming, and I, and I hate this word, you know, a, a trusted advisor. Um, because people come to you for advice rather than thinking you're trying to sell to them. And, and how do you build that type of relationship with people? Especially it's, yeah, really it's, hard it, people. It's, it's a long-term thing. Um, I think market knowledge is really important. So knowing what's going on in their life, where they want to take their firm, what's going on in the firm down the road, and then getting to know them and their firm. Um, 
I know it in a lot of these discussions, you talk about finding the problem, finding the pain, which is very important. But actually, I find finding their ambition um, is sometimes more important, either their ambition as an individual or as a team or as a firm. And that's a more positive way of actually trying to sell to them because you're helping them achieve whatever their next goal is. And I got to imagine that they don't like to spend a lot of time with salespeople. They're they are professional billers. They get they get rewarded yeah. on their time mostly. A lot of the people I deal with at the senior level have stopped doing the billable work, um, and they are now managing the firm. Yeah. So, and depending on the size or the level of firm, you can get to know them quite well. Uh, so, especially been doing it for so long, um, and I think because I've built up a network of of contacts. I can open most doors um, and, and I come with some value, which I think hopefully they appreciate. And what is that value? I think it's knowledge. Um, I think it's knowledge of how technology can help them improve their firm. It's knowledge of knowing what the guy down the road's doing. It's knowledge of knowing what's coming around the corner in the legal market they may not be aware of yet. So I can have intelligent conversations about looking like I'm just trying to sell them some more software. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I take it you do a lot of prep before you have that meeting. Prep is absolutely key. Um, and now when I'm running a team, I'm trying to get that across to the team that you know there's no point in doing a demo without knowing what you want the outcome to be. There's no point in just trying to, to wing it because you'll get find out, found out in the first couple of seconds. So actually prep is absolutely key to everything we do. And what was your motivation to get into leadership instead of staying? You probably could have done better as an individual contributor. Yeah. I, honestly, I'm not a very good manager. Um, <laughs> um, I'll, ta- I'll pause the recorder. <laughs> no. My team know that. Um, they're, they're already aware. It's not news. <laughs> what I really get out of it is the, the mentoring and the training and helping them see their way through a sale, watching them grow, helping them achieve their personal targets and the team target. I'm just not very good at doing the holiday requests and the, you know, the, the annual appraisals and all of that sort of thing. I'm it's, it's not what really interests me. At the moment, it's really about getting these guys up to be as good as they possibly can and giving them whatever little knowledge I've learned along the way to try and help them uh, move their career forward. And what makes a great rep in this space? Um, persistence, um, empathy, um, product knowledge. Um, and a willingness to work hard. You know, this is not a nine to five uh, job. Um, quite often, my guys will get phone calls on a weekend, um, after hours, early morning. And we always try and say that you've got to be available. You know, it's, it's not what you want to do. But if they're reaching out outside office hours, they're after some help. Um, and if you can be seen to be helping them, it's going to make it easier to have the next conversation with them. Yeah. And what doesn't work in this space? I'm sure you've either inherited or maybe. Yeah, I think what doesn't work is is telling people what they need, um, being overconfident, um, perhaps being that old fashioned salesperson that, you know, you know, everything, they know nothing because. They're quite. They're they're obviously an intelligent bunch that we work with, but they're actually very knowledgeable uh, also about technology. Um, in the UK, I think the legal industry has always been ahead of the game when it comes to adopting technology. So if you go in without preparing, thinking you know it all, you're not going to get very far. And they're very detail oriented. Lawyers are that's yeah. their whole thing. There's a lot of proof points. Um, so demonstrations can go down some very, very strange rabbit holes just because they need to see, or you, they need to see you prove that what you say you can actually do. Um, it's in, in big deals, it, it's not, you know, we, we often have half day demos or a whole day demo. Um, yeah. and we tend repeating ourselves quite a lot, but it's, I guess it's gaining their trust and, and it's showing that what we can walk the walk as well as talk the talk. 
And do they make decisions faster than? <laughs> if I if I if I tell you I had a conversation with an IT director that um, actually congratulated me because it had been eight years in the making. Now that's not normal. Yeah. That's not normal. Um, typically, we can be six to twelve months um, from showing first interest to closing, but a lot of the the bigger de deals um, can take years, um, yeah. and, and a lot of them depend on where the firm is in their buying cycle. You know, if they're if they're doing a project X and that's taking a couple of million pounds and it's taking the same resource that you need to do your project, that project's going to take precedent. And you could be a couple of years while you're just keeping keeping them warm, keeping them interested, and then they'll come back to look at your project. So the key driver is to be more competitive than the person down the street? Is that Yeah, and and I think it's it's been knowledgeable as well. Um, so seeing it from the client side, um, not rushing them into a decision. Now, this is a long game uh, yeah. for us. Um, and having the right product. Um, unfortunately, lawyers can be a little bit led by the guy down the road. You know, it's the old saying, you never got fired for buying an IBM. It's pretty typical in the legal industry as well. If there's a market leader, people will look at that first and they're less inclined to look at something else that may not be quite so well known. So they're thinking like at the judge, right? They need yeah. so social yeah. proof. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> An expert witness. <laughs> and I does the buying cycle, I, I like in the US <laughs> for partnerships, the buying cycle would be the end of the year so that they don't have to pay taxes on that money. Not so much, um, and especially with when you're dealing with partnerships, you know, the partners, as I said before, the partner's almost spending his own money. So he will purchase throughout the year. Um, and if he wants it, he'll tell the rest of the firm he's going to get it. And then they worry about how they're going to pay for it and how it's going to fit into their, their over, overarching structure. Um, so no, quite regularly, um, you know, we have good first quarter, which is January uh, quarter. Third quarter is always slow, which is summer holidays. Um, and, and Q3 is always a race to the line to do target. Yeah. And I got to assume they ghost you quite a bit. Go, yeah. 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 Um, and, and you said it quite often on, on your podcast, you know, phone calling is, is dead, really. You know, it's, it's so easy to dodge a phone call. Um, it's actually now easy to dodge an email as well. So once again, that longevity, having contacts means that if they want to speak to you, they will pick up the phone. Um, but if I was coming in cold, I'm not quite sure how I would cope with being ghosted quite so often. And the way in is through networking? Uh, nine times out of ten, it's through networking. It's knowing someone that can open a door for you. Um, sometimes that's via the IT team. A lot of the uh, IT guys are very open for discussions. Sometimes it's via uh, what they call the knowledge manager, uh, so someone that's running the CRM. Other times it's directly uh, to the partner because he's heard about you from somebody else and and and, and thinks you're, you're you're worth talking to. Yeah. And have you seen any? I don't know if you've ever sold in the U.S. or managed. US team. Is there much difference there? Or? Um, technology uptake in the legal market in the US has always been behind the UK. Um, a lot of the stuff that we sell is making lawyers more productive. Um, but obviously, in the US, if you're billing, you don't want to be too productive because the longer you take, <laughs> the more you can bill. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, it is changing. Uh, we are seeing a, a lot of the US firms uh, adopting technology in fact they're probably sneaking ahead of the uk at the moment um but a lot of law firms the pressure they're getting from their clients is they have to be more transparent they have to be cheaper they have to do more for less they have to make sure the right guy's doing the right piece of work so you don't get a really expensive lawyer charging 400 pound an hour doing an admin job so that that transparency is is driving the use of technology yeah and how about as far as working for U.S. companies? Have you worked for a U.K. company? I have. I, my first organization uh, that I worked for in legal technology came out of Miami, um, a company called Equitrack. Uh, yeah. They did the photocopy control devices. Um, really liked it. Um, I really liked the, the American mentality. I, I like the work ethic. Um, I don't like the fact that they started at 
two o'clock my afternoon time. <laughs> so, yeah. and, my, and they were still expecting me to work at eight o'clock UK time. But you sort of get used to that. Um, and I used to like uh, coming across to the US and, and seeing the UK sales, uh, sorry, the US sales guys. Um, there were some really, really good sales guys back in the day. And, and, and I learned a lot from them um, about hard work, about um, how to approach clients, um, how to have that perseverance on, on chasing the case down. So, yeah, I, I really still enjoy working for US firms. And what do you look for when you're hiring? I take mm. it. You're probably in a hiring position sometimes. It's a really good, good question. Um, in fact, we've just hired somebody. And we had the usual inflow of CVs that were sales orientated. They've been doing the same thing. And and you look at it and you think it's a little bit tired. Maybe they're not as hungry as they once were. Uh, uh, how do we freshen this up? Um, so we sort of cast our net a bit, a bit further. Um, we actually found uh, an attorney, what we call a barrister, um, somebody that had been actually stood in court um, for the last 15 years, and she wanted to get out of uh, that and into sales. Um, we took a bit of a risk, but it's worked out so well. Um, and I think casting your, wet not, your net wider actually gives you a much better chance of finding s- some fresh uh blood some fresh impetus to actually bring different skills into the team um i watched one of your podcasts when they when when you were talking about hiring hospitality people um and i think that's a great shout because you've got a lot of empathy there you've got a lot of hard work they know how to deal with difficult customers so i think perhaps you know if we were doing that again we would look wider um than than perhaps we would have done a year ago yeah I be when I think of a lawyer, I think of somebody who really does a lot of administration, documents, yeah. everything. Really, and sales, eh, it's, it's really you know getting that conversation started, getting the dialogue going. What what we found, Brian, was the fact that the person I'm talking about had to stand in, in front of a judge. Litigator, um, and what we call it. yeah, and and had to have all the evidence ready. Had to be very confident in front of the judge. Had to be very well prepared. And if somebody threw a curveball question at them, they had to have the answer. They had to think on their on their feet. Yeah. Um. And actually, that's come across really well. And and the ability to talk to strangers um, is something that, if you've never done it before, is quite a difficult skill to pick up. And the person we hired absolutely had that skill. It was re- a really good decision. Yeah, I can certainly see the litigator part of it mm. uh, because that is selling. Absolutely. Absolutely is selling. Because oh. you're, the beauty contest, your competitor is right next to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you got to have the empathy. What are they going to say? Yeah. What's their yeah. case going to be? Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's in a, can you imagine a sales situation where you and your competitor are in the same room having to demo at the same for time weeks. for weeks on end? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, at least in the, the U S legal system, there's this uh, discovery phase Yeah, yeah. where there's paperwork going back and forth questions, um, depositions. Yeah. So it and is that- a complex sale. Absolutely. It is a complex cell and you're dealing with a whole variety um, of of people and third parties. And that's one of the complex things about selling into legal. You know, you don't actually, sometimes you don't get to see the guy that's buying it. Um, You know, you're seeing the person that's going to use it and you're impressing them and you've got the IT guys on board, but the guy that's going to sign the check, sometimes they just won't let you near him. So you've got to find ways of, of working around that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's part of the skill. And how do you arm that IT person with the things that that senior partner who's going to sign it? I think that's where you find your coach, isn't it? That's where you actually are. You get to know them. You know what makes them tick. You know what makes them look good in the eyes of their superiors um a lot of it is showing the benefits other firms have gained from the same system be that cost savings be that time savings be that just being seen to be using modern technology 
Um, so that's the, the way that we arm the people that are trying to sell up for us, is, is to give them as much information as possible. Um, we always write our proposals almost as though they could be used as internal selling tools for the people we give them to. Um, so they're written in a way that is easy to read, not particularly sales language, right. and is always looking at what the firm is trying to achieve, how quickly they're going to get there, what are the what are the steps they've got to go through. So it almost, if if you can't get to the right person, you give the person that's going to get there all of the ammunition they need. Do you have much influence of why now? versus adventures sometimes um sometimes there's a burning bridge where um you know we we have deadlines to meet sometimes it's a nice to have um which is always the difficult difficult sale at the moment we're seeing um a rush to the cloud um law firms want to be in the cloud tomorrow so a lot of our sales are um, decisions being made. We're going to the cloud. It's going to be in six months' time. What do we need to do to get you guys on board? So that's a, a different sort of sell. That's almost been brought in after the decision's been made. Um, and we don't have a lot of influence. We just have to stick to their timetable. And what's their motive to get to the cloud? Is it to remove the liability from their IT to yours? <laughs> A lot of it is that yes, um, and and sometimes it does feel like Turkey's voting for Christmas um, when IT people are saying, right, I just want to get all all of this tin off my decks. Um, there's a big move in the UK to subscription rather than capital purchase, um, and I think that's driven by uh, the finance people seeing that they can spread the cost, use different budgets. Um, so it's a combination of wanting to be seen to be leading edge wanting to get off old hardware that perhaps is coming to the end of its five-year uh, lease and also finance thinking that spreading uh, an operational cost versus a capex is a good thing to do and when you're talking to your team how do you determine how real the deal is oh i'm glad you asked this one so <laughs> Before I started, there was a very formal um, forecasting process in place. Um, and quite often the guys were asked, well, you know, you haven't got four or five times your pipeline. Go and go and fill up the forecast. You know um, it works. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then four weeks later, there's too much in the forecast. Trim it back <laughs> down. It and, yeah. Scrub it. So the guys are spending, you know, a week, a month doing something somebody else said just to, so I scrapped all that completely. Um, we no longer have a, a team or a formal uh, pipeline review. Um, we do that on a one-to-one a -one basis. Um, we probably do it weekly. Um, I tell the guys to make sure that anything in the forecast is, is real. Um, so we really wire brush every opportunity in there um and so far it's worked really well uh, we've always been ahead of target uh, we're always ahead of the curve i know what's coming in the amount in the pipeline is, is a lot less but the quality is a lot more um and we have this expression in the team uh, and, and and once again you said it the other week where you have a salesman that comes back from meeting and it's a slam dunk so it's going to close it's going to close and month by month yeah exactly and he moves it on a month in the forecast so we now have this expression it's not, i can't eat promises um and everyone's now quoting that so if i say is it a promise can I eat a promise? Like, oh, actually, no, it's not this week. It's going to be three months down the line. So we have those really in-depth conversations um, about every single opportunity in the pipeline. Um, and we really make sure that we review it in a casual sort of way every week. Um, and then we move it forward we, um, um, and we look outside the pipeline. So we say, okay, what's not in pipeline? Let's go through your client list. What else do you think you're going to be working on? What are you going to be working on in nine months' time? What do you want this client to be looking at? So we've taken that formal pipeline review, which actually didn't do the salesperson any good, um, and we've tried to turn it into a proper tool that allows us not only to see what sales are coming in, but to be thinking six, nine, 12 months ahead as to where we want to be. And 
<clears throat> within the account, uh, I can't see like IT being the champion unless it's a, like an upsell of an existing product. It's got to be probably somebody on the legal side. Yeah, IT, probably up until about five years ago, IT were very much the way in. Yeah. Um, and then I think they learned their lesson and they became a facilitator rather than an owner. Um, I think too many of these large projects were put at the door of IT. And when they went wrong, IT carried the can, even if it wasn't an IT project. So now we're, we're getting in more at partner level, team leader level, um, and we're trying to concentrate on what the team or the, law, the lawyer wants to do using our technology. And we're looking at how we can make their life easier, how we can give them better information in a more understandable fashion, how we can allow them to carry more cases without actually letting uh, the quality um, they deliver to their clients slip. So a lot of it is now based with the users rather than the facilitators. And, and how do you make that switch from educating them? Because I'm sure a lot of them want to learn I mean, yep. you work for a hot company that's dominant in this space. If they don't have it, they want to know what it does for their own career to somebody yep. who has a real business case that is going to justify a purchase. We have a lot of people treat it as an educational exercise rather than a selling exercise. Um, and to be fair, you know, we don't mind too much. Um, we'd rather educate them today so they buy tomorrow. Um, but what I have to get the team to understand is someone that's on an educational hunt isn't going to buy this year. Um, so you want to get in, do what you got to do, get out in a reasonable fashion, but keep in touch with them. You know, how's it going? Is is now the time to take it a bit further? Did I tell you the guy down the road's just done this and these are the sort of benefits he's getting? So we don't mind doing the educational stuff as long as it's not everything that we're doing. And do, do you find like um, news events of a big case or a loss of a case or there's some kind of trigger event that's visible on the Internet? It's very difficult because nobody really wants bad news out okay. there. So we, yeah. we, we very rarely hear, hear when, when something's gone terribly wrong. Um, we do scan social media and the Internet to see what our clients are doing. On a, on, a reg, on a daily basis, we have these tools that um, go across a whole set of media uh, and bring back hot, hot topics. A lot of it we just use to show our clients that we're interested in what they do. So, you know, we'll drop them a line and say, hey, just saw this, sounds really exciting, anything we can do to help, or hey, just saw you just seen you've taken over the firm so-and-so did you know they already use our software let's have a chat so we're actually using it as a very soft way to talk to our clients and i got to imagine that the timing of the closure is insanely difficult because you're dealing with professional negotiators yeah yeah um the worst part the worst part of the deal is when they say they want to do it and ask for the contract um because a contract in our world will probably add eight weeks to the deal. Yeah. And, and they will go over that contract with a fine tooth comb. Um, I've had the bizarre incident where we actually employed a law firm to write our contract for us. And then we sold to them and they rejected their own contract. <laughs> too, good. It's too strong. <laughs> too strong. Exactly. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> well, that's it because. You know, like when you sell to us, I always sold to software companies. Yeah. So they know how software companies sell. Exactly. And the bigger the ones and you're dealing at the C-suite, they know your end of the quarter. They know because everyone plays the same games with them. They yeah. wait to the exact last minute. Then they pull something out and they say, well, can you give us five more points? It's not quite that bad. Um we, we try not to be that desperate salesperson at quarter end or year end. Um, we almost say, well, you know, if you don't want it this year, we're still going to be around. Just come back when you're ready. Um, there are times when, you know, a little bit of a pressure is applied, but they will only buy when they're ready. Uh, you know, we can influence them. We can take it so far, 
But at the end of the day, if they want to delay, we have to delay, which is why I'd say being in, in, in it for the long term tends to help. Yeah. And what advice would you have for a young salesperson getting into selling into legal or into this kind of non selling technology into non technical companies? Yeah. Um, I think it's know, know your market. Absolutely know who you're selling to, know why they're buying. Um, Know your clients, um, really understand where they're coming from, what their ambitions are, um, and know your products. Um, there are a lot of people out there that take along someone to do the demo for them. They have no interest in the product. And they're the guys that are still scrabbling around trying to do deals. Know your product. Be able to have an intelligent conversation with your clients about why what you've got will deliver benefits to them and always look for the benefits absolutely that's the key i think right because your product i I remember a crm company that had technology people demonstrating it and a salesperson selling it and it was like yeah the salesperson's the user (laughs) absolutely if they can't figure out how to use it you're kind of admitting (laughs) that it's complicated yeah exactly exactly (laughs) that and and and, yeah you know what technical people are like they want to go down to the nth degree of a technicality and they lose the audience within Point. A, yeah so when we're doing demos a lot of it is we're driving the guy doing the demo and it's almost like demo stop explain repeat demo stop explain repeat and making sure the audience is coming with you um and I think they appreciate that. And, and the guys that we've got doing the demos are now really good at knowing, do it in small chunks rather than going down a rabbit hole and there's no way back. Cool. Hey, I really appreciate your time today, Martin. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, or you can email me at martin.siddle at lexisnexis.co.uk. Thanks, Brian. It's been a real pleasure talking to you.